Morning, everyone. Um, hope you're all doing well. Good to see you. Uh, shall we pray, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into um, our our Bible passage and talk for today. Let's pray. Um, Father, thank you that you are speaking, God. Thank you that you are speaking to each and every one of us. Uh, please give us ears to hear what you would say to us today, uh, as we open the Bible and as we as we wrestle with what it's going to teach us. Uh, May we know you speaking to us, encouraging us, and shaping us, and challenging us. Uh, and we pray to that end, please come, Holy Spirit, you who have inspired the Scriptures, so speak through them to us. And please help me speak well in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I've, I think I've told this story, well, not I think, I think I know I've told this story before, um, of, a, of a journey that myself and a bunch of men took from our past church and um, visiting Romania in 2019. Uh, myself and a team of men uh, visited there for 10 days and we met a guy uh, when we were there called Lee Savile. Lee Savile heads up an initiative called Networks uh, working uh, among the Roma people of Northwest Romania. Um, he was a corporate lawyer um, but gave all of that up after uh, coming to the Lord. That was the first step. Uh, and then secondly, secondly come, finding himself walking through the, the main train station of the city of Arad in Romania, northwest Romania, coming outside of the, tra the train station and discovering there in front of him so many street kids. Uh, he was there on business. Um, that night he went out, he bought vegetables, he made soup, and he went back to the train station uh, to feed the street, street kids that he had found there. And that was the beginning of an initiative that meant he would leave behind uh, a very lucrative job in the law firm that he was working with, leaving the UK, moving to Romania, moving to Arad, uh, and that was 1996, and he's been there ever since, working with street kids, building orphan orphanages, and working with their parents. It was a remarkable and life-shaping story to hear. Maybe some of you have heard of a man called John Kirby, um, who became a Christian in the early 1990s. He was a, an entrepreneur. He had been through one marriage. Uh, he was in colossal debt. He describes himself as hopeless and broken. He met a Christian uh, who met him and his daughter uh, at their lowest point. He showed John and his family the love of Jesus in very, very practical ways that not only lifted John out of debt, but would lead John to encountering Jesus. And John would go, to, go on to find an organization that many of us will have heard of, Christians Against Poverty, an organization that comes alongside people in debt and walks with them to lift them out of the desperation of debt. I don't know about you, but I love hearing stories like that. Anybody with me? I, I just love hearing stories about that. I love stories like that about the kingdom of God coming, about uh, people being helped in very practical ways of folk coming to faith. I just love all of that. I could listen to stories about that all day. Here's another story. 2015, uh, the movie Spotlight won an Academy Award. Um, it's based on the true story of a team of journalists from the Boston Globe um, who uh, were investigating um, abuse uh, within the Roman Catholic Church in the Boston area. The investigation uncovered dozens upon dozens of clergy uh, who, be, who had been involved in abusing children and the cover-up that went on to hide it. And it quickly became apparent that this wasn't just an issue within the Roman Catholic Church, but was present in many other Christian denominations and not just in the United States, but around the world. That's a very different type of story, isn't it? It's not the first time the church has been entangled in a scandal of this extent. We could go back to uh, the Crusades in the 11th century when soldiers who described themselves as Christian pilgrims at the behest of the Pope broke into Jerusalem and slaughtered thousands. There was the Inquisition who compelled people by force to repent and come to faith. There was the 
association of the Dutch Reformed Church with apartheid in South Africa. There was the German church in the 1930s and its association with the Nationalist Socialist Party, and I could go on. I don't like those sorts of stories. Because these sorts of stories beg a whole gamut of questions. And here's probably the most important one. What does the failure of the church say about Jesus? If so many of his followers can behave so terribly, does that mean that we shouldn't take the message of Jesus seriously? Um, did you know that 39% of Americans, this was a, a, a poll taken quite recently, did you know that 39% of Americans agree that religion does more harm than good? That figure rises to 61% in the United Kingdom, 63% in Australia. I don't like hearing those statistics. That makes me exceptionally uncomfortable. To help us wrestle with these questions, uh, we're going to turn to James chapter 2, and um, we're going to read verses 1 to 17. Um, James was the brother of Jesus. He was a key leader in the earliest days of the church, and he's writing to a community of Christians who you might argue were doing more harm than good. Uh, in this particular instance, the, 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 the Christians, or some of the Christians within this particular community had fallen into the into partiality they were not treating and loving people equally uh, they were treating the rich within their congregation so much better than the poor uh, and so james writes to them and he, this is what he says this is james 2 uh, and i'm reading from verse 1 my brothers show no partiality as you hold a faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and says, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, will you stand over there or sit down at my feet? Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my brothers, has, and this, this is an incredible statement. Listen, my brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? I'm going to fast forward to verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, which, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not, if it does not have works, is dead. Now you might be wondering, why am I rabbiting on about this. Well, we're in this little sermon series uh, entitled uh, The Problem with Christianity, uh, and we're looking at some questions uh, that people raise who say they have a problem with our faith. Uh, and, uh, and this is what we're looking at today. We're thinking about Jesus and the failure of the failures of the church. Uh, and what, how do we respond to that uh, if that is an issue that people have? And, and maybe you are here today and actually you're thinking to yourself, do you know what? That's right. Um, maybe you've heard people say in your workplace, religion or Christianity does more harm than good. Maybe you've heard some of your family members say that, or maybe you're here today and actually you're wondering whether that's the case. Well, how might we respond to that? Well, a couple of things from our Bible passage, which I think will help us wrestle with this uncomfortable subject. Here's the first one. According to James chapter 2, God has chosen the poor. According to James 2, God has chosen the poor. Now let that sink in just for a moment, that the God of the Bible has chosen the poor. 
It's there in black and white in verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world? There it is. God is towards the poor. He's towards the slave. He's towards the person on the fringe. He's towards the weak. He's towards the sinner. And this is, in fact, an historical fact. Most of the people who became Christians in the early church were either poor or vulnerable or on the fringe of society. When those early Christians talked about Jesus, about who he was and what he had done, the poor flocked into the church, the economic poor, the socially poor, the slaves, women and children. And do you know it's still true today? The vast majority of Christians in the world are poor. Well, why was that? Why was it back in James's day? Why is it true in our day? Why is it that the poor and the vulnerable and those on the fringe flock to Jesus? Well, there are, are two reasons, I think, for this. The first is, is that Jesus is so compelling. You see, the Bible tells me that Jesus, the creator of the universe, has loved me so much that he has given himself completely for me, that he's died for me on the cross. But not only has he come to save me, but in saving me, he has put his spirit within me, his very presence in me to be with me and never leave me. But not only that, Jesus has given me a purpose and has invited me to partner with him in seeing others come to know him and see communities and even nations transformed. You see, Jesus is so compelling, so empowering, no wonder the poor flock to him and his church and still do. And you see, it's in this sense that the God of the Bible has chosen the poor, that he's for the poor. And the second reason is that Jesus is most compelling to the, to the poor because the poor, above everyone else, know they are in need. One day Jesus was debating with the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, and he, he didn't miss and hit the wall. And he told them in no uncertain terms that the drug dealers, the pimps, the prostitutes were entering the kingdom of heaven before them. You might ask yourself the question, how on earth is that possible? And the answer is this, that they see their need much more clearly than people like me do. And that was true in Jesus' day, and it's true in our day. It is often the people who know their need who are quickest to run to Jesus for help. Whereas for people like me, it takes a long time to convince us that we have any need. Listen, my brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? God is towards the poor, the slave, the person on the fringe, the weak, the sinner. This is who the God of the Bible is. That's the first point. Here's the second thing I think James is teaching us, is that the church... Me, us, we have forgotten that. We have forgotten that the God of the Bible is towards the poor. We have forgotten that. This church community in which James is writing to had forgotten that fact, that God chooses the poor, and they had begun to favor the rich and the powerful, and to ignore the poor, to abuse the poor, to take advantage of them, to forget them, and James calls it out. He doesn't hesitate to say that this is not Christian. Verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save them? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. To understand the force of what James is saying to the church, we need to understand this relationship between faith on the one hand and works on the other. 
To cut a long story short, for James, works are the marks of salvation, not the means of salvation. I am saved by faith in Christ alone, by faith alone, by grace alone. But you can tell that I am saved by faith alone, by grace alone. How? What are the marks of this salvation? James's answer, your works. My works are the evidence that I am saved. Works are the marks of faith, not the means of faith. So James is saying, if Clive, if your salvation is genuine, that will be, there will be clear evidence to prove that. And I think for us this morning, it's important that we hear that. With the presence of Jesus in my life, there is going to be clear evidence of the fact that both individually, myself and yourself, and as a church family, there is going to be evidence of our salvation. There ought to be clear evidence of Jesus in the church. But, 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 and this is key. What is the specific evidence that James is pointing to in verses 14 to 17? What is the evidence that James focuses on in verses 14 to 17? Answer, serving the poor, welcoming the slave, the person on the fringe, the weak sinner. You see, that's the evidence that he focuses in on in verses 14 to 17. Now, is that the only evidence? No, it's not. But that's what James is focusing on in this passage. That the way that I respond to the most vulnerable, to the weakest, to the poorest, the way I respond to the, the most dreadful sinner on earth will be evidence of my own salvation. So God is, what does the passage teach us? God is for the poor, and James warns us that the church can forget that fact so easily. And sadly, as we look down through Christian history, there are clear, there is clear evidence that there have been times, many times, when the church has forgotten it and acted appallingly. But the question for us today has come into land is how do we respond to the terrible failures of the church in the past and in the present? Here's the, the first thing I think we need to do. I think we need to acknowledge them. We need to acknowledge that these things took place. It's very tempting to downplay our failures. It's very tempting to cover them up and hide them. I love the good news stories. I want to hear lots of those. I get really uncomfortable. I got really uncomfortable last Monday morning when I opened my phone and, and, and clicked on the BBC website, and, and there was a story of a Nigerian pastor and that, that story describes how, um, I'm talking about hundreds of, of women uh, who were abused by him over many, many years. I, I want to hide from that, but I can't. I can't. Instead, I think we, we need to be grateful that the truth has come to life, light. Uh, that, we, that every injustice, that we need to acknowledge that every injustice needs to be exposed and welcomed. That the church need to, needs to own its wrongs. You see, evil is evil irrespective of who commits it. And it's not enough to point to the failures of others because I could give you a list of failures of what atheists have done historically 
And as for the Muslims, boy, I've got a long list there. It will not do for me to point to the failures of others. You see, and I believe this with all my heart, it never harms Jesus when Christians admit that they're wrong. It never harms Jesus when Christians admit that they're wrong. We were wrong is a, is a positive response to the wrongs of the church. But what if you're here today, and this is where you stand, that Christianity has done more harm than good? What if that's you and you're here today? How, how, what, what, what might be said to you this morning? Well, perhaps I could end by asking you a question. Knowing that the church, Christian church has got it wrong many times, the question I would like to ask is this. Is this a reason to reject Jesus and his claims? And as you think about that question, perhaps you might consider this also, uh, that the need to acknowledge that these failures are not the whole story of the Christian church um, would be fair, I think. The need to acknowledge that, yes, the church has failed, yes, but that that is not the whole story. That perhaps there is a willingness to recognize that the church has acted well. Not that its good cancels out its wrongs, but because that would be a fair picture of the church. Because the stories that I told you of Lee Saville and John Kirby are true. And they have had a profound impact upon hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands, of people. And they are two story of thousands of stories. To speak fairly of the church, we would need to speak about the impact of the abolition of slavery, of education, care for the poor, of human rights. And if that's something that you would like to explore, I would encourage you to read two books. First is by a guy called Tom Holland, called Dominion, and the second by a man called Glenn Scrivener, The Air We Breathe. I would want to argue that the message of Jesus and the person of Jesus is not invalidated by the behavior of some of his people. So where does that leave us? Coming back to us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, where does that leave us? A recognition that God is for the poor, in the broadest sense of that word. That we must never, ever, ever forget that. And where we see the vulnerable and the weak being taken advantage of within the church, that we would have no hesitation of saying that is wrong. Why don't we pray? So we've come to the scriptures this morning, Father, and uh, we've read them together and reflected on them. Uh, and we pray for the truth of, of James 2 uh, to sink deeply into our hearts, that we would know again who you are. Thank you for that day when you met us with your mercy and your love. That even while we were yet sinners, lost, far away, without hope in this world and in the next, you met us and you brought us home. Thank you for that mercy and grace that we have received, not only on the day that we came to faith, but every day since. And we pray that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would, would help us to to be instruments of your grace and your mercy 
and your love to everyone around us. And that, Lord, you would help us to remember who you are, remember who you are for, and that we, Lord, would follow you in that. We pray this in Jesus' name.